And the next presentation is uh, Dr. Schwartz. The topic is uh, clinical advantage of high speed CZT. It's cadmium zinc telluride spec cardiac imaging. Dr. Schwartz, please. Thank you, Shimon. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to uh, speak to you today and update you on the current status of nuclear cardiology. Uh, we're going to talk about advances in nuclear from perfusion and function to patient-centered molecular imaging. And it's not lost on me at this uh, opportunity that uh, our friend Dick Meltzer died suddenly, and I want to share with you some current insights of research in nuclear before identifying the substrates in uh, infiltrative disease and ischemic disease for identifying risk of sudden death uh, in today's lecture. And I want to focus specifically on some clear advantages of cadmium zinc telluride spec perfusion imaging for advancing the field. So first we'll talk about why nuclear cardiology. What's the background? We'll take the 30,000 foot view and move quickly. Nuclear imaging, despite the name nuclear, is actually, I believe, the safest of the non-invasive methods for identifying incremental risk. Uh, there's a 20-fold incremental risk assessment of the exercise compared to exercise ECG in the Duke treadmill score. Uh, there's a two-fold incremental risk assessment compared to stress echo and exercise Duke treadmill. SPECT identifies the normal six times more accurately than stress echo compared uh, on the basis of large observational trials uh, from the Cleveland Clinic and Cedar sinai Medical Centers and others. Nuclear enables us to track the effectiveness of treatment of stable ischemic heart disease and it enables us to measure the uh, residual risk associated with ischemic disease. We can add regadenosine as an add-on vasodilator stress to patients who are unable to complete exercise adequately. With the current cadmium zinc telluride imaging technology, we can now use ultra-dose imaging. I'm going to show you this morning uh, for imaging patients. Uh, and it is much safer than coronary arteriography, principally because we don't face the contrast risk that is such a problem for many of our patients with uh, nephropathy uh, who need uh, functional uh, and perfusion evaluation. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the cost-effective aspects. Alterations of flow are associated not only, as we know, with the stenosis on the angiogram, but with the diffuse atherosclerosis, since flow is related to the fourth power of the radius of the artery, as well as vasospasm in this elegant work by Schockinger, published in circulation in April 2000, 14 years ago, we learned that arteries that look normal that are spasmed by uh, the use of vasodilator stress identify the site-specific development of stenosis an average of 3.7 years later and identify those patients who are more likely to go on to have actual coronary clinical events. And we need to understand that when we measure uh, fractional flow reserve in the conduit artery, we're looking really at only a small portion of the entire coronary tree, which uh, is associated with coronary risk. And the myocardial flow reserve that we measure with radionuclide perfusion imaging integrates the entire conduit and microvasculature, uh, which affects uh, flow and risk. Now, the incremental value of exercise perfusion imaging has been shown many times in the literature. Here's one study going back to Pancoli, looking at a series of women in Philadelphia. And clearly we see that the addition of SPECT perfusion imaging in addition to cath exercise and clinical information substantially augments the risk assessment of the model. And when we remove angiography from the uh, equation, we don't lose any of the predictive value of the model. This has been shown in men as well from the same center uh, in Jack. When we compare two large observational trials from the Cleveland Clinic, published by Marwick in circulation in 2001, and Rory Hakamovich's classic paper in March 96 circulation, we can see that if the, in the intermediate Duke treadmill score group in the middle, there's a substantial incremental risk assessment identified by perfusion imaging, higher on the high end and much lower on the low end uh, compared to stress wall motion studies with echocardiography in excellent institutions doing this work. Leslie Shaw has shown us in the Economics of Non-Invasive Diagnosis study that when you randomize the selection for cath versus selective cath based on the results of perfusion imaging with SPECT, the group on the top that has selective use of catheterization 
identifies an enriched uh, group of patients who have virtually in round numbers twice the percentage of multivessel disease and roughly half the percent of uh, patients who have single vessel or no disease. The cost implications of this at all levels of pretest risk are that the diagnostic costs and follow-up for the selective cath based on the SPECT results is uh, much more cost effective for uh, the, the uh, selective group compared to routine cath. Just one example from our recent clinical experience at Rochester, a woman who uh, presented with what was suspected to be a Takasuba myopathy with some elevations of troponins who ha had uh, a small hyperdynamic LV with no wall motion abnormality identified, indeed had a substantial, severe, and extensive perfusion defect, not associated with much wall motion abnormality, and indeed had a clear-cut coronary arteriography demonstrating a high-grade stenosis in the circumflex lesion, which was su uh, successfully intervened upon with improvement in outcomes. We have a substantial literature of acute imaging based on this meta-analysis put together by Gary Heller with very high negative predictive value for acute rest imaging. And we know from the work of Hilton and others that the use of Tech 99 m in the emergency department has substantial incremental value uh, compared to exercise, ECG, and clinical information alone. When we look at the information modeling, the addition of SPECT again demonstrates improved risk stratification of patients based on the rest stress alone. Now one of the benefits of perfusion imaging is the ability to identify the value of medical therapy as well as revascularization. These are seminal data from the work of Lance Gould and Dean Ornish published from the University of Texas and Baylor. Uh, looking at disease progression over five years. On the top, we see someone who, by rubidium stress PET, has progression of disease in the inferior wall. And on the bottom, we see someone who has a significant improvement in perfusion by PET imaging over five years with lifestyle therapies and medication. Indeed, it takes only 90 days in a separate publication for this group to demonstrate using rubidium PET substantial improvements in perfusion associated with risk factor modification. At Rochester, here's a patient who presented with stabilized, unstable angina, was found by perfusion imaging to have a severe and extensive LAD perfusion abnormality associated with a high-grade proximal stenosis of the LAD. This patient elected to be treated with lifestyle therapy and medical therapy, not uh, intervention. As you can see, uh, with the use of niacin and provostatin, her LDL uh, comes down significantly. And within a year, her perfusion has improved remarkably. These are unretouched photos. And this actually was a fairly common experience at our observation, similar to what Lance Gould had described with PET. In March uh, 2001, we presented at the ACC in Orlando uh, findings from Rochester with Tom Pearson, uh, studying patients who had serial perfusion imaging from a research study at six weeks in the middle and six months on the right. Uh, you can see the uh, significant improvement in perfusion uh, which occurred over this time period associated with therapeutic response. And the COURAGE group subsequently, two months later, demonstrated on the front cover of circulation similar finding of aggressive medical therapy improving perfusion in uh, many patients. So the COURAGE trial demonstrated that ischemia reduction of greater than 5% was associated with a reduction in death or MI rate compared to those patients who had no ischemia reduction. So the change in ischemia appeared to identify favorable improvements in outcome. Well, the CEDARS group has gone on to show us a substantial impact of uh, at what threshold of extent of ischemic disease do patients benefit from revascularization. Uh, this study of uh, over 13,000 patients, almost 14,000 patients, uh, confirming a prior 11,000 patient study from 2003 has shown that at right around 10% myocardial mass, as we normally uh, identify it with semi-quantitative analytic techniques that are commonly in use, that we can identify those patients who benefit from early revascularization as opposed to ongoing medical therapy. Recently at the ACC in 2014, in a, chair, in a session I was privileged to chair, our colleagues at the Brigham using rubidium PET identified very similar trends from this propensity analysis uh, showing about a 7% threshold beyond which using rubidium PET revascularization appears to add uh, reduction of risk uh, rather than uh, ongoing medical therapy.
Now, what about patients who have uh, hibernating or viable myocardium? Here's a patient who, by uh, rest thallium and 19-hour redistribution imaging, appears to have some limited redistribution, but not to a level of viability, which we define as at least 50% of the maximal myocardial activity in the myocardium. Uh, going out 36 hours, we see a bit more redistribution uh, in this particular patient. We did a uh, F18, FDG, uh, glucose and insulin loaded PET study uh, to confirm these results, which identified significant hibernating viable myocardium, as you can see, associated with a perfusion defect extensively over the uh, septum. Uh, so in the face of impaired perfusion, we have intense uptake of FDG, similar to the late redistribution thallium study that we saw before in this patient. This patient had an ejection fraction of 25%. And the question clinically was, should this patient receive an ICD, or should this patient be revascularized? And uh, after an initial refusal by the surgeon, the cardiologist, a trainee of mine, in, uh, prevailed upon the surgeon to proceed with surgery. And the result was an improvement within a month of ejection fraction from 35 to 55 percent. And the long-term outcome was, after five years, a continued improvement in the ejection fraction of 40 percent. Uh, and so rather than getting an ICD, this patient actually has done very well from a uh, clinical standpoint with improvement in function and symptoms with successful revascularization. Uh, our friends at the Brigham have put together this comparison from the, the, the literature as of three years ago, uh, showing on the top that FTG PET uh, appears to identify the optimal technique for quantifying this substrate of viable hibernating myocardium. Now, this viable hibernating myocardium that is what we think that we're identifying with FDG uptake in the face of perfusion and abnormality is not a substrate that was even looked at in any systematic way in the STITCH trial. We do, however, have data coming from Ottawa, the PAR-2 trial, uh, looking at the ability of PET in those patients whose management was adherent to guidelines compared to standard therapy, and clearly there was significant benefit to following the imaging recommendations provided by perfusion imaging and FDG metabolic imaging to identify the substrate of substantial hibernating viable myocardium to identify the benefit of revascularization. The Ottawa 5 substudy from the Otto group uh, showed again that outcome benefit can be achieved in a center that can experience with experience that can integrate the findings of perfusion and metabolic imaging with intervention to improve outcomes. How much myocardial hibernation with viability does one need in order to realize this beneficial outcome? Well, again, the Ottawa 5 group has demonstrated that in excess of 7% uh, myocardial hibernation, similar to the ischemia mass that we saw before, seems to benefit with an improvement in uh, hazard ratio uh, for improved outcomes. Well, let's move on to a consideration of another major advance in the field of nuclear cardiology, and that is vasodilator stress imaging, stress testing with regadenosine, a selective A2A agonist. Uh, compared to adenosine, selective A2A agonist, and the only one currently on the market is regadenosine, uh, selectively uh, dilates the arteries of the uh, coronaries uh, without all the other complicating effects on A1, A2B, and A3 receptors, which can contribute to many symptoms and potential side effects we have begun to associate with diperitomal and adenosine imaging. And so we now know that uh, after approximately a 10-second administration, we can do an entire stress protocol within one minute. We can reverse patients with either aminophilin at Rochester. We we're in the process of publishing some uh, results on caffeine as well. Works very well to reverse the vasodilator uh, induced symptoms, and we get very accurate diagnostic information. Large studies have demonstrated safety of regadenosin use in patients with advanced COPD, asthma, and CKD, and so we no longer have to be concerned about uh, avoiding the use of pharmacologic stress testing in these important populations. We can conditionally add regadenosin to patients who we think might benefit from exercise testing, and so we can get a full exercise test without worrying uh, that we're going to lose diagnostic or prognostic effectiveness. You can simply add on the regadenosin and get a very accurate uh, and prognostically and diagnostically useful test. Now let's put the nuclear cardiology radiation issue into perspective 
Uh, Image Wisely is a program uh, involving educational campaigns, information statements, dose registries, and le reference levels. Uh, as Vice President and President of the Cardiovascular Council of the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging, I had the privilege of spearheading this uh, uh, white paper that we published in July 2012 looking at the proven clinical effectiveness, which is much, much greater than the theoretical unmeasurably low radiation risk associated with routine nuclear testing. And now with the current cadmium zinc telluride imaging techniques I'm about to tell you about, we actually have pushed the radiation levels from 9 to 11 millisieverts down to 1 or 2 millisieverts for routine imaging. So a major advance in our therapy. In the uh, modeling of the potential risk, Gibbons et al. from the Mayo Clinic have shown in the lower uh, curve on the uh, bottom here in blue uh, a theoretic risk of oncogenesis associated with a 40 millicurie dose of technetium 99M sestamibi for every year from the age of 40 to 80 compared to background and in the natural history of cancer. And you can see uh, what a uh, very small signal of risk theoretically there may be with such a high and unusually uh, intense dose of radiation in adults. Nevertheless, we want to figure out ways to optimize safety and effectiveness. We do this by following the appropriate use criteria. Uh, we now do stress-first imaging uh, in low to intermediate risk patients. And we can combine this with cadmium zinc telluride uh, and uh, really achieve ultra-low dose imaging. The appropriate use guidelines were first published uh, in the field of nuclear cardiology in 2005 and again revised in 2009 and 2013. And here we see on your uh, handheld device you can have at your fingertips all the appropriate use uh, criteria for ready reference. The ACC's implementation of the focus group promises to provide point of ordering appropriate use feedback to patients who are thinking about testing. Let's talk a little bit about stress first, stress only imaging. We now know from the work of the Baylor Group and John Mamarian, patient group of 17,000 patients, that uh, we have excellent uh, outcomes uh, with a very large group that are quite similar to stress and rest imaging, as you can see, with 61% less radiopharmaceutical use. These are some of the newer cameras. Uh, the one on the right is the Spectrum Dynamics camera that we use at Rochester, which involves nine uh, collimated detectors which rotate and now provide the opportunity to image at low dose with two minutes of imaging, very rapid imaging. We have uh, iterative reconstruction, 10 times the speed of acquisition, two times the spatial resolution, and lower radiation dosage as well. This high quality stress first study uh, involved the use of only 2.9 millicuries of tech, less than one millisievert to get a diagnostic normal study. And the average stress-only studies now are uh, exposing patients to only 1.25 millisieverts. The Mount Sinai group has identified the ability to acquire these CCT images in three to five minutes routinely. Here's a, a patient of ours from Rochester, one of our cardiology faculty actually, who had chest pain all night, came in, was admitted, and ruled out in the uh, coronary care unit, who has a stress-first image that was entirely normal. Here we have another stress first study of a 39-year-old man with no diagnostic changes on his ECG, but atypical chest pain, non-positive troponins, had an abnormal stress test on stress first imaging. We then noted that with both supine and upright imaging, this is an ROC curve showing the superiority of the combined approach to identifying the uh, validity of perfusion defects. We then did a rest imaging to identify stress-induced ischemia in this patient, who by noon the same day was able to then go on to have intervention on a tight right coronary artery stenosis. So dual imaging is also very useful for obese patients. Here you see a pseudo defect in the inferior wall on the top of each of the four row segments. And you can see that in the third row, the stress upright eliminates this artifact very readily. And we have a paper that is being uh, considered for publication now looking at this approach. Here we see a patient who has a very significant uh, uh, treatment uh, of his uh, disease. Here's another obese patient who clearly identifies normal low-dose imaging, very useful. The combination in these obese mm -hmm. patients, as we presented in uh, last uh, October in uh, Chicago at the ASTIC meeting, the combined upright supine approach identifies with high sensitivity,
and specificity seen in red, uh, these pa obese patients in terms of the ability to identify very accurate techniques. So at Rochester now, we're using uh, this technique for identifying uh, coronary disease with high accuracy uh, from a multicenter study with three institutions. Well, let's then finish with advances in nuclear cardiology. Uh, we traditionally look at uh, semi-quantitative uh, uh, flow analysis using the standardized approach. And we know that the, using this approach, using PET, we can identify clearly incremental risk associated with increases, increasing levels of abnormality of uh, uh, tissue. When we actually quantify the absolute right. flow reserve, as seen in this uh, uh, study from the Brigham, we can clearly identify incremental risk. Using this study from the Brigham, we can see that one-third of patients are reclassified as being at uh, either low or high risk from intermediate risk. And using the CZT SPECT perfusion imaging, we now are beginning to look at ways using SPECT rather than PET for identifying incremental value of quantitative flow, looking at the uh, tracking of uh, the tracer through the myocardium using wrong, TEC 99M wrong, and coming wrong. up with coronary specific flow reserves for each of the uh, territories. Future directions involve the serial assessment of lifestyle changes and medications, correlation of LV volumes and ejection fraction, and we look to uh, see if we can identify a reclassification index using the SPECT approach Ron, for quantifying perfusion. Please conclude. Okay, so we need to conclude. Let me move forward. We're using MUGAs. We can do these with eight minutes, with eight millicuries, very rapid and low dose imaging. Uh, finally, uh, MIBG can be used to risk stratify patients in heart failure. Dyssynchrony can be used to quantify those patients who will benefit from biventricular pacing. I don't have time to go over this in detail at this time. And in terms of uh, uh, risk of sudden death, patients who have sarcoid uh, can be identified now with a multimodality approach using CZT SPECT imaging. Here we see on the left, a CZT spec perfusion abnormality that is a very unusual distribution in the basal septum and mid septum associated with a fasting FTG uptake that's quite intense in the uh, uh, FTG image on the right. And this identified the presence of sarcoid in this patient. And this patient who had intractable ventricular tachycardia uh, was benefited uh, by the use of steroids where no other antirhythmic was useful, uh, within 72 hours resolved. And we can identify the therapeutic benefit of steroids using this type of imaging. So let me conclude that uh, in 2014, we now have the ability not only to do risk stratification, but indeed to look at the molecular substrates for uh, uh, sudden death using both uh, cardio-oncology, looking at MIBG, looking at dyssynergy and looking at both infiltrative and ischemic uh, substrates for a sudden death. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.